Japan was the trade surplus country. So Japan was like France in my earlier example. They had the surplus, they were being paid in dollars, which were almost as good as gold. The dollars went into Japan's economy, and they made Japan's economy boom. But the US didn't deflate, unlike England, because it wasn't paying with a limited amount of gold, it was paying with paper dollars and treasury bonds denominated in paper dollars. And there was no limit as to how many of those the US could create. So the US trade deficit kept getting bigger, Japan's surplus kept getting bigger, and Japan's economy boomed and boomed and boomed and boomed until the gardens around the Imperial Palace in Tokyo were said to be more valuable than all of California. And then Japan's bubble popped because the debt level was so high that the Japanese people did not earn enough money to pay interest on the debt, even with 90-year mortgages. The Japanese had three-generation mortgages, and they still couldn't pay the mortgage bill. The bubble popped. Well, this is what's happened again and again since then. All the countries with trade surpluses blow into bubbles, and sooner or later, they all pop. The next round was the Asia crisis countries, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Korea. I was living in Thailand from 1990 until 96, and that's where I learned how this works. The country with the trade surplus or with an overall balance of payment surplus, a lot of foreign money comes into that country. It goes into the banking system. It causes rapid deposit growth. That forces the banks to have rapid loan growth. The rapid loan growth creates the boom, and then the boom bust. Now, more recently, as this grew to $800 billion, it was no longer a matter of just one country or one region being blown into a bubble, country after country. Now, it's the entire world has been blown into a bubble by this US trade imbalance. This is the source of the global imbalances that have destabilized the world and created a global bubble. Again, this is not going to continue to get bigger and bigger. This has made life very easy for us for the last four decades. It's going to be harder going forward. Now, this shows China's trade surplus with the US. I'll touch on this quickly, but there's only been one explanation. There's only one reason China's economy has been transformed over the last 20 years. It's because of its trade surplus with the United States. In 1990, China didn't have a trade surplus with the United States. This year, it will be $300 billion. As that money has gone into China, it's completely transformed China's economy. It creates tens of millions of Chinese factory jobs. It leads to hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars being invested in Chinese factories. And it leads to extraordinarily rapid deposit growth and loan growth and economic growth as the trade surplus money comes back into China. It has blown China into the greatest economic bubble in history. And when China's trade surplus with the US started to cor correct in 2009, that almost popped the bubble then and there. The Chinese policymakers responded with an extraordinary policy response. They allowed Chinese banks to grow total bank loans in China by 60% in two years. Chinese bank loans grew by 60% in two years. Now, what would happen to England or the US or any normal country if bank loans grew by 60% in two years? Property prices would triple, everybody would have a job, wages would go up, and everyone would feel very happy for a while. But then in years four and five, no one could repay the loans, and the banking system would collapse, and the government would have to bail them out. That's where China is today. China is teetering on the verge of, 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 of economic collapse, and they will have to do what Japan has done and what the US is now doing, have massive, US, have massive budget deficits to support the economy that way. China's fundamental problem is that 80% of the Chinese people earn less than $10 a day. So they can't afford to buy the things that they make in their factories. They used to sell all the surplus to the Americans and the Europeans. Now America and Europe is in crisis, so they can't do that anymore, and they can't buy the goods that they make at home. Therefore, there's no any sense at all in continuing to grow their industrial production capacity by 20% every year, as they've been doing for the last two decades. The great China boom is over. Now, it's very useful to think of the global economy as a big rubber raft, OK, a big rubber raft. But instead of the rubber raft being inflated with air, it's been inflated with credit. On top of the raft, on top of our global economy, you've got all the stocks, all the bonds, all the commodities, including gold, and 7 billion people, the world's population. 
The problem is, is the raft is now fundamentally defective. There are holes in all the sides of the raft, and the credit keeps leaking out. So the natural tendency of the raft is to sink. And when it sinks, the stocks go down, the bonds go down, the commodities go down, and the people start to go down. Now, the reason the raft is fundamentally flawed at this point is because globally so much credit has been created that the seven billion people on Earth do not have a high enough income to service the interest on the debt. Therefore, they keep defaulting on their U.S. mortgages, on their Greek government bonds in Ireland, Iceland, China. People don't have enough income to pay the interest on this debt. So they default, the credit leaks out the sides, and the raft sinks. Now, there's only one possible policy response to this. Policymakers are terrified that if the raft goes down, not only are the assets going to crash, but people are going to begin to die. So there's only one possible policy response, and that is to pump in more credit into the raft. That is what the policy response has been all about, and that's what it's going to continue to be about. So that's why the governments are running trillion dollar budget deficits, and that's why the central banks are creating trillions of dollars of paper money. Every time they do that, they inflate the raft again, and it, it floats up again. And assets go up, and the people are happy for a while. And then because the credit starts leaking out of this fundamentally defective raft, it sinks again, and they have to repeat. So that's what QE1 was about, QE2, LTRO, and now QE3. And that's what we can continue to expect in the future. Now, the reason policymakers are so terrified of this raft sinking is because they believe that this could be a replay. If it sinks, they believe it will be a replay of the 1930s and the 1940s. And I believe they're very right to be concerned because the two crises came about in exactly the same way. In my view, the Great Depression originated in World War I. In World War I, all the European nations went to war. They were all on a gold standard but they didn't have enough gold to fight the war. So they went off the gold standard and they started issuing a lot of paper money and issuing a lot of government debt. And all of that debt and all of that paper money created a worldwide credit boom that we call the Roaring Twenties. That was fun, they say, but in 1930, the credit couldn't be repaid and the international banking system collapsed and global trade collapsed and policymakers didn't know what to do. They believed in capitalism and laissez-faire so they just stepped back and they let market forces work. And market forces did work. They reestablished a market-determined equilibrium. Unfortunately, that equilibrium was at a level of GDP in the United States that was 46% less than it had been in 1929. 46% less. And a, a range of unemployment between 15% and 25% for the decade of the 1930s. A decade in which Europe became fascist, and Asia became fascist. And then World War II started. And at that point, US government spending increased 900%. And that increase in government spending ended the depression, but the war killed 60 million people. Now this time, the pattern has been exactly the same up until the policy response. The Bretton Woods system broke down in 1971. That was a kind of gold standard. Afterwards, the government started issuing enormous amounts of paper money and government debt. And all of that paper money and government debt has created a four-decade global economic boom without precedent. In 2008, that credit couldn't be repaid, and the international banking system started to collapse, and global trade started to collapse. But this time, instead of allowing market forces to reestablish a market-determined equilibrium, policymakers are doing everything in their power to prevent that from happening, because they fear that, once again, that equilibrium could be at a level of GDP 30 or 40 percent lower than it was in 2006 with horrific geopolitical consequences. So that's the policy response. That is a rationale for the policy response, and that is why policymakers are going to continue aggressively injecting liquidity into our global raft until they have no strength left in their bodies. So you can bet on bailouts, because if they don't bail out Greece or a big French bank or whoever defaults next, then the raft is going to sink and we may collapse into a very severe depression. So this, over the last 20, this shows the US budget deficits, <coughs> trillion dollar budget deficits, 2012 will be the fourth year of a trillion dollar.